All right. Today is a great day because many people know your favorite actors. You'll know them by what they've done visually. Sometimes you'll know them by what they've done because of their voice acting. So well, today, a taste along the way. Let's do that. So everybody knows Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but in 1986, my guest Pat Fraley got a job for a very weird named cartoon that I think he... was a wonderful day to rule the universe, Shredder. It's Lord Crank to you. Shredder, why haven't you completed my new body? Oh, but I have. I wonder if you thought this was going to be a very short-term job when you yeah. got that in 1986 had Luke, to be the craziest show look uh, they recast the director who put himself in four roles and did the uh pilot on a saturday now the producer fred wolf was shall we say frugal and he <laughs> fired him so i took over yeah. krang or i auditioned for him and it was like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I thought this will never go anywhere. No, it sounds crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it became, it, you know, I consider it my second favorite show. And what blew me away and made me want to reach out to you, I'm a kind of a business guy. I would, I call myself a, uh, a small time or minor league entrepreneur doing small businesses. And I, I love, I love creating things. And so I find myself to be kind of an artist without the artistic talent. So when I see people like I grew up in the uh, Seattle uh, shadow. So I didn't grow up in Seattle. I grew up in central Washington, but I and loved what was going on as I was growing up in the nineties. I loved that there was this new versioning kind of American punk scene with grunge in Seattle with Nirvana and, I loved that. I just loved that there was something connected to my area. And so when I learned that you had roots in Seattle, it blew me away. And then I learned that, hey, my top two favorite shows of all time, he's the top bad guy and the top good guy. And my favorite shows, it just blew me away. And so what I mean by that is there's a show that everybody knows, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and you played three roles on that. Am I correct in that? Three roles? Yeah. Uh they had you for three voices for the for one contract in those days. I did okay. four or not. Well, I was four, but I couldn't do it. I said, Fred, I can't do. Uh, I can do Bird Thompson. Go, go, go! Right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I can do Baxter Baxter Stockman, Fly Guy. And I'm yeah. doing Fly Guy. Right. And oh. uh, Frank. And then they had me in for. Uh, Mercy, scum. I'm putting you punks out of business permanently. That guy's out of control. Whoa! Hey! Easy there, cowboy. They're down. You stopped them. You did good. Now take it easy. I'm out of here. Let's get out of here. Oh, man, they're getting away. Stay out of my business, freak. You can run, Purple Dragons, but you can't hide from Casey Jones. And so I did all sorts of stuff. We yeah. all did. That's why Barry Gordon and Cam Clark did Rock Steady and Bebop because no one else was available. They never did anything like that, but they learned. So tell me a little bit about the business then. So I've I've heard you in an interview once say they wanted me for four and I said I could only do three. And I thought it doesn't seem like a big workload, but I thought maybe this has something to do with the Actors Guild or what, why was it that you, because certainly you go look at your IMDb and you're in like a thousand, like literally yeah, more yeah. than a thousand things. Why is it you can only do three and not four? Well, it's a matter of separation. Plus, when you got all four in one show, it's a little problematic. Mm. Three is plenty uh, okay. in one show. And, and we did all the villains. I mean, we never had a guest until three years into it then we got some guests for villains like jim cummings came in and other people would come in but we did everything 
And so uh, it was like too much. Yeah, yeah. At some point, there has to be a cutoff, and that makes sense. Um, yeah. What's interesting about these shows is you go back and you realize that there's two things that I realized in looking at the IMDb of these shows that I that shaped my childhood. That, that uh, you know, TV became uh, your favorite pastime, but it also became a bit of a babysitter. So, it, it Brave Star was so interesting, and not a lot of people know it. And I'll put in some B-roll so they'll see it, and some will recognize it. But that show was so keen, and, and not all shows are like this. But was so keen on teaching good lessons, and I thought that was interesting. Yeah, so now being a parent, you'd always well. When I was a parent, and I had four boys in five years, and one boy, the eldest, was alive, and uh, Brave Star was on. Speed of the hawk, eyes of the puma, strength of the bear, Brave Star. Right now, yeah. I didn't play heroes very often. Cowboys of Moo Mesa, Centurions. I don't know. Where I learned to be low and quiet, yeah. but that was a hero, and so I would have Pappy and his uh, what do they call those? He'd be eating off a tray in a seat. Yeah, high chair type thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I go eyes of the hawk, you know, strength of the bear. Of Puma. And then I'd say pee pee wolf. And they, my cousin Camp Clark never said anything funny in his life, and I'm. <laughs> yeah. Dang. Of course, they could care less. Yeah, it, it's funny. Not, they, as, not as much as the turtles. Yeah, the roles the roles I remember are like, oh, yeah, they're the turtles, but then it's Krang. And, uh, in, in, yeah, the heroes sometimes, it, I think Batman's a good example. Like, everybody loves Joker. Joker's this homicidal maniac. Yeah, but, Mark, uh, Mark Camel and I have an interesting story. We uh, showed up for a rehearsal, or no, for an audition. And at the bottom of the page that we had was uh, we're interested in uh, Tim Curry or John Glover, I think his name was. We open the door. There's Tim Curry and John Glover sitting seated there. And I went, what are the odds, dude? You know, come on. Sure enough, Tim Curry got the role. But after a whole season, he was too low. He was a baritone. And they needed a higher jerker. Well, I auditioned, went too far. Sure enough, I go in for the audition for the ADR looping to take care of Tim Curry's role. I do too much. Mark Hamill gets it, and he was so good from then on doing uh, the Joker. Yeah, that that's incredible. I, you know, I've wondered. There's, I'm a I'm a big sports guy, and um, there is a a fraternity um, amongst basketball players, and you'll consider. Hey, these are the best basketball players of all time. He's the Michael Jordan, or you'll hear him. He's the Kobe Bryant. And and in in voiceover acting, you know, I've always heard the name Mel Blanc. But then as blank. I blank, sorry, sorry. Bugs Bunny, Porky Pig, Sylvester, Tweety Pie, Daffy Duck, Elmer Fudd, Yosemite Sam, Barney Rubble are just a few of the cartoon voices that this man has immortalized. It's a pleasure to welcome Mr. Mel Blanc. Mel, welcome. <laughs> What's up, David? <laughs> uh, that's a great sweater you have there. Oh, thank you very much. I like it, too. Yeah. Uh, now, that's not your actual voice, is it? No, I have a very deep voice. Uh, do you... Uh, do, you re do you remember the first uh, voice that you did? Yes. I do. I remember the first voice I did. Now, that's oh, your so real voice right there. This is it? my real voice, yeah. yeah. The first voice I ever did was this. <laughs> that was a, I don't remember it, but that uh, was the first yeah. voice. <laughs> yeah, and you'll hear other names. As I've done more research, I've heard names that come out of your mouth a lot are Don Messick, you know, uh, June Ferre, Dawes Butler. Butler. Dawes yeah. Butler was the best voice of an actor ever. Mel was more dynamic. But Dawes had the acting chops. Dawes Butler is a better than an average bear. He's a dog with a southern accent, and he's one of the most famous voices in animation today. Yeah, hi. I'm Yogi Bear, and I'm smarter than the average bear. I'm Huckleberry Hound, and I just finished part of my autobiography. And I was a little puppy dog, 
We used to have grits every day to eat, grits. People used to say, you like grits? I'd say, well, I like grits a little bit. You're moving your lips. And you know, uh, actors are notorious for lying about their height and lying about their age. Well, in voiceover, you don't worry about the height. Dawes yeah. Butler was like 5'2". He was a run. <laughs> But he had the he did Yogi Bear, Huckleberry Hound, Yogi Bear. I mean, he was yeah. phenomenal. And I got to meet these guys and work with them at the tail end of their career. I did Jetsons and oh gosh, Flintstones and all these shows, but it was the tail end of their career. But I loved that. It was the late 70s, early 80s, before Brave Star, which was 86. Yeah. And Ninja Turtles were about 86, 87. Yeah, and what's interesting is I, I was listening to one of your interviews um, and they did such a good job asking questions and they pulled something interesting out about Dawes Butler that you'd mentioned. He'd had a stroke in his 70s and what blew my mind is the the baby boy on Jetsons. is he's doing it, Roy, the boy. And he's doing that after a stroke at 70. That And, and when I heard that, I went and pulled up YouTube and listen to that voice and it it was incomprehensible that that could be somebody in their 70s really i asked Dawes, how do you do that and of course he made sort of a dance out of the line they give him he'd have to practice it right yeah but he but he looked at me and said well everything's new <laughs> astro like astro's never been gone before mom what's for dinner like he's never <laughs> had dinner before and that yeah. was his key to doing it elroy a nine so what type of impact when you're around greatness we, we talk about it all the time like oh you want to surround yourself by great people but what were some of the things so you land in the late 70s around some of these these titans the 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 all-stars of all right. time hall of famers yeah. what were some things that you picked up from from working with these people even though it was the tail end the talent was still evident in there well, uh, I learned my technique. Like they go, hey, how you doing? <laughs> you know, the other day I was talking to this guy and they were moving around. And I just thought it was a steel lollipop. You know, it would <laughs> yeah. capture you. Yeah. But they yeah. were moving around, so I learned that. I learned a couple of, you know, techniques. But, you know, we were all together. And, and we... We didn't learn as much as we performed as comrades. So it wasn't yeah. like, oh, he's the old guy. Well, Mel Blanc, he was like, oh, wow. I remember sitting next to Ken Mars, who was a wonderful actor. He did the uh, Frankenstein guy with the crazy, you know, oh, wooden, yeah, yeah. right? Kenny yeah. Mars, he was nuts too. And he was seated, seated next to me on my right. Beyond him to his right was Mel Blanc on a little uh, stool smoking a Salem, you know. And I mo I turned to say to Kenny Mars, oh, I love your work. And, and as I turned, he turned to Mel Blank and said, oh, Mr. Blank, I love your work. And it was <laughs> that moment. Yeah, that's great. I mean, there, it, it's so interesting because those guys became – the voice of when we think of actors we always think of you know the the brad Pitt and the, and yeah, Brad Pitt. yeah yeah but what's interesting for kids they're not i i was showing my kids a show that makes me laugh called psych um it was on about 10 years ago it's they're just really funny and i like it it's at the end of a hard day it's funny to just laugh a little bit silly detective comedy and and uh you know my my three-year-old He'll sit down a little bit, but what really gets him is the the inanimate objects or the characters that are cartoons. And what brings life to them in understanding is these characters. And it, it dawned on me the other day that the voice actors, it's, it's more than what you think. And even what you just said, he brought the physical element with the mic. That's the education right. that I got. It's well, what uh, what happened, Lucas? I've been able to shop anywhere, and unless I mention it, like thank you, or I'm gonna have to talk to my union about this. Being the bird on the they strap on the Flintstones, strap on Flintstones. Yeah. Unless I say something, they don't know. Plus, 
the idea is that when I do a conference or I meet people and they know, we're sort of like puppets. They own us. Now, look, if you walked down the street and saw Brad Pitt, you probably wouldn't go up to him. You might go, yeah. good job, or, you know. Yeah. But yeah, they nice to meet you, Mr. Pitt. They hug me and they go, oh, do this, do that. They own us. And uh, it's yeah. delightful. It, you're so right because I I love movies. I've never reached out to an actor. I've reached out to one actor and it's you. It's a voice actor. And it's there's something special. You know, it's like, why is it that I the music that I loved when I was 15, I still love? And why is it when I was a kid and I saw the old people loving the music they loved when they were 15, and I said, I will never be like that. Well, Lou, get it's this. It's impactful. I, I got a Master of Fine Arts in acting from Cornell. I went six years of college, went to Australia, didn't know what I was going to do. I wanted to be a performer. So uh, one, somebody said, oh, we like you. You're so big, we can't get the other actors to be that big. <laughs> So I went, okay, there it is. Well, who's big? Uh, cartoons, right? Yeah. So there I go. About two or three years later, I'm walking into Hanna-Barbera. I hear Dawes Butler and uh, Don Messick, who did uh, um, Scooby-Doo. Yeah. And I'm, I'm tripping because I remember listening to those guys when I was 10 years old, the Rough and Ready show. They've been working oh, yeah. that long. And the rest of the cast, Frank Welker and the gals, they've been working on that show for 10 years. They started in 69, and they this was 79. It was a shock, but they're, they were still working. Look yeah, and, and, and that's what I love about what you're doing. I mean, you've been very, very successful. And you, everyone, please notice what's at the bottom here. That's a link. It'll be in the description. You'll be able to click it. But... What's great is it's great when people love what they do, where they just keep doing it. The people that I've uh, admired that have been grandparents or, fr you know, grandparents of my friends, they are busy till the very end and they love what they do. And uh, you go to your website and it's very apparent you love what you do because of how much you give away. And well, you go teaching and performing my entire career since I was four years old. They love shooting me because I died well, right? <laughs> and then I tell them, okay, you going to arch your back and foam and say, ah, oh, God, Lieber, and die as a German. And they say, well, what if you're American? Well, Americans don't die. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So They're the heroes in every I story here. I enjoyed it. And I found uh, where I was good. I was exaggerated because my mom grew up at deaf school. She's here, not hearing impaired, but her father was the superintendent of deaf and blind schools, deaf school oh. mainly. And so she was very exaggerated. Oh, that was dumb. Dig yourself out of this, you moron. You know, she, we half signed, half spoke. So I always say I learned how to act from the deaf. And I was great, great at theater, a lot of theater, because you had to give them a little bit more to reach the 25th row. Right. When Chekhov was due, eh, the pilot light went out, you know? I did yeah. about 50 plays, but I was not good at that, you know? Yeah. Uh, but that that was, uh, and I also, my first job in Australia out of school was uh, teaching at a university, teaching vocal dynamics, as they called it then. So I was teaching, and I'm still teaching. I teach more, I don't perform as much because I'm old. I'm 74. I mean, I, I'm in a business that you don't retire from. You get retired. Yeah. Well, yeah. Another another corollary to sports, right? They. Uh, what's yeah. interesting? You or, or, or boxing? Or boxing? Yeah. You're done yeah. At 30. Yeah. You you don't decide when you're done. The other guy does. <laughs> yeah. You go yeah. down. Yeah, you go down. Well, I. So, you have this unbelievable imdb and it's super super cool because th there's little nuggets in there that blew my mind and one of them was your buzz lightyear and i was like wait a second tim allen's buzz lightyear and then you read and you're like well guess what tim allen gets sick tim allen gets busy and when oh, we yeah. need to fill in we go to pat fraley and i thought funny that's story. interesting 
I, I auditioned for it, and it's not a marriage made in heaven. To infinity and residuals, right? <laughs> yeah. But um, the, there's a funny story behind that because uh, they, you know, Goofy and Minnie Mouse and Mickey, they all get 800 bucks every time they open their mouth, right? Yep. Now, Tim was very busy, so he couldn't do it. And it was like made more toys than any other character at Disney at that time. So they said, oh, we've, I figured, okay, 800 bucks, that's cool. Get this. Tom Hanks, who was very busy too, said, yeah, only my brother Jim can do my voice. Now, hmm. I had signed a favored nation clause in a contract with Jim. So whatever he got, I got, and vice versa. It's a way of keeping the price down on contracts. Okay. Well, once Arlene and Thornton, Jim's agent heard that, said, oh, by the way, he's not 800, he's 2,700. Every <laughs> time he opens his mouth. So I made bank. Now I don't yeah. do Tim Allen, but I but get this. One of his lines is something like I protect the universe from the evil and preserve. Sworn enemy of the Galactic Empire. Where's that bonding strip? And another thing, stop with the spaceman thing. It's getting on my nerves. Are you saying you want to lodge a complaint with Star Command? Oh, how? Okay. Oh, well, so you want to do it the hard way, huh? Don't even think about it, you boy. Oh, ye, top of guys. I am Buzz Lightyear. I come in peace. Buzz Lightyear to the rescue. To infinity and beyond. Not today, sir. Right? Well, mm -hmm. strip all the way. I protect the innocent from... The evil Emperor Zerk, sworn enemy of the Galactic Empire. He's John Wayne. He's John Wayne, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can do John Wayne, that's why I got the part. And it lasted for about uh, nine years. I was making a couple hundred thousand a year. That's that's awesome. That's really, yeah. really cool. Yeah, I've, I've always wondered, I remember really loving Aladdin, being like eight when it came out, and then seeing the uh iago disney show and uh you could kind of tell when the voice slightly changed and it was good enough where you had to like do a double take is that him is that gilbert godfrey or is that not and uh it, it you could kind of tell if you if you if you listened long enough and watch enough shows but it, yeah. it's always interesting because you guys are so good that yeah there's there's some differences um but you can't really tell what and then i start to listen to you in your interview and you break down you literally when you i'd love for you to break down crane's voice because sure. your construction of crane's voice is brilliant it's well just in, amazing. in australia i'd go in to teach vocal dynamics these 17 year olds that's a age they go to uni we mm -hmm. go what you did today because I knew I did something other than plays and teach. Yeah. I said, well, I did a commercial. Oh, yeah? What? Well, Walter Brennan, give us a taste. <laughs> well, I said, well, he's got a low. And then, no, no, with your throat, mate. Well, he's got a low voice. He's from, uh, I guess, Connecticut. Much faster, right? <laughs> I had to break it down. So I was the, I'm the only person or the first person ever to break the character voice down to its six elements. When I came to L.A., I thought, oh, I'm in the wrong league. They're so good. After a couple of weeks, I realized they were like, as Michael Bell says, Mr. Potato Head. They change your nose and ears, and that's all they do. Yeah. I'd go, wait, I've heard that voice. Oh, yeah, it's got a different dialect and a different show. So, Krang, there's six elements to any given character voice. Pitch, pitch characteristic, rhythm, tempo, and mouth work. That's five. Okay, so pitch. Well, I give him a big range of because he's evil and he can be real sneaky and real, right. Pitch characteristic. Well, I gave him a cottony sound because he's centered in the back because he's a blur blurring blob. And tempo. Well, I very it can be very fast and very slow. Part of the villain. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, pitch, pitch characteristic, rhythm. I gave him a undulating rhythm because he's a blob like Catherine Hepburn, and so that was yeah. going on. And then uh, for mouth work, I get mad at my boys and I go, "Now, Usi, put that 
down and I get heartburn. Now <sighs> heartburn kind of was like that, right? Yeah. I learned in fourth grade how to talk backwards. <laughs> I said, well, I can't do it after a line. I have to do it on a line, right? Right. Timing well, is it's important, yeah. Right. And then it said, but funny. So I went, I did a trick. And so I would go, this is what I get for surrounding myself with <laughs> If you scrape all that off, listen. This is what I get for surrounding myself with idiots. It's a Jewish mother. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They always make me laugh. And so he was funny. P plus, I work with James Avery. He's a six foot four African American man. He's dead now. Yeah. And it was like this. He was a wonderful char character actor on stage. But when he did the cartoons, he was like Johnny One Note. Crying, what are you doing? Yeah. Like that. So. Yeah. That meant I could get right over the place. Oh no, yeah, not really. Right? Yeah. And we got known as the odd couple from outer space. <laughs> it was a good I've combination. It, a great combination. And when you learn, so again, it's interesting to learn all this stuff post facto. I learn all this stuff like, hey, I grow up watching Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I grow up watching uh, Tailspin, you know, something else that you did. And yeah, grow up... yeah, that's a great story, by the way, Luke. Oh, let's, um, I, yeah, yeah, please tell it. Like, well, how did you get that job? Everyone, they were having a hard time casting it because the character has a big prognathic, a large jaw. So yeah. everybody was being stupid and big. And I thought, mm. well, maybe I'll make him naive. You know, yeah. maybe, maybe he's innocent. And yeah. it was my access to that kind of character. Because if you hear that deaf, they have no tone. And then they'll spin wildcat balloons, it's your inch or banana. I forgot. I thought yeah. you could. It was based on a challenged character. Mm -hmm. Who is so uh, I did it. I got cast. 20 years later, I get a, uh, a call from a psychologist in New York saying, hey, I have a autistic student on the spectrum we say now uh -huh. would you like me to have her call you i went yeah to this day morgan is a buddy of mine i call her molly cat and she calls me uncle wildcat and uh here's why she would go to public school because they had resources for autistic kids mm -hmm. she'd be humiliated all day then she'd come home from school and uh, Tailspin was a Monday through Friday show. Mm -hmm. You'd watch a show and see this challenged character who's loved by everybody. Everybody, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He was a mechanic, but but good at his job, but interesting. It didn't yeah. matter. They loved yeah. him. And yeah. uh, it, it reminded me of Bob Hope. I never thought Bob Hope was funny. But then I realized this guy is making people laugh they're going to die the next day. <laughs> That's why he went to war over in Tarawa. He had 15,000 in a, in an audience made him laugh the next day. I, I won't say all of them, but they died. Mm -hmm. So you talk about putting meaning in your life. I mean, I'm in the amusement business and that's Greek for all muse yeah. is not think, but when you can make them feel, and do something like that, you're in a whole new realm. Yeah. Yeah. That so, well, Mamaya, you know, it's all God's plan, breaking the character voice down, finding they actually do that in LA, teaching. It's all part of a plan that I'm, I'm not aware of. But my life and my performance has been more meaningful as I got, I've gotten older. Well, and what's so cool is you find meaning in things like that's one of the reasons why, you know, I'm kind of a businessman. I do crypto stuff, but I want to broaden it out. And I started doing this and I, I, I see some of the stories that you tell, like what you just told you do this. Uh, I might get the year wrong, but basically you do this uh, show for one season. It's got a lot of episodes, like 65 or something tailspin. Yes. And it's this, uh, you know, it's the third, fourth character, whatever it is. And it, it's it's super fun but it connects with somebody 
two decades later and there's yeah. meaning because of what all the effort that went into learning how to do the character properly and it, it's easy to dismiss things oh it's just a show and for some that's true but for some it connects in this other way and it has like you just eloquently stated this greater impact and it's really cool when we don't necessarily understand the plan of it all but it it connects in a way and uh that then you still have this connection with uh this person it, it's re really Luke, cool. I tell you, uh, when i when my son my eldest son was 24 he died Oh, I'm sorry. About and that. I had a lot of people that got hold of me and my wife, Renee, and they had the same circumstance, di dying young, suicide, all these mm -hmm. things. And we could talk to them and send them a book or, or do something and let them know that there's life after losing a son or losing a child. Yeah. And um, so there's a meaning, too that they actually listen to you because you're doing all the silly stuff and getting through it. You know, I had to get in the car and go be Dinky the Duck after my son died. Yeah, but yeah. I was able to do it with God. You know, with, believing in God helped me. Well, I, I, love, I love that. I think that's a big part of why some of the characters connected with, with me is because I saw some of the things that my parents were teaching me saw some of the things that were being taught in Sunday school or just, just even at school of yeah. what it takes to be a good person. And then you, it is fun to escape and to like the bad guy. But at the end of the day, when you really want to try to be better, you think of, Hey, I want to be like that guy. I want to be like this voice yeah. actor, or I want to be like this character I watched growing up. And there's a reason why I'm not watching cartoons right now. And when I think of cartoons, I think of Brave Star. And I wanted to, to shift just, just for a little bit to, sure. to that because this is a show that I feel like is becoming a cult classic. Like as I look on YouTube, I see more and more. All the episodes are up. Like, what was that experience like? Because you're doing all these characters up till 86. You get this random show in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles that turns into one of the most important cartoons of all time. And well, then, here's what happened. It was yeah. a futuristic Western. There's never been one like it. No, never. But the problem was, and Filmation did everything in one spot. That's why it would only take 20 minutes to do a show. We didn't have to uh, put take one, take two, take a line three. We didn't have to do that. Americans were editing. And then they go upstairs and do the cells. And the, the scripts came down. Well, what happened was... They got distribution in the toy stores of the doll, Brave Star, before it was out in the theaters. We, yeah. we, we uh, did a movie it with a feature length film. Yeah. Well, it just died. Yeah. They had end out of displays of Brave Star and it just died. No one knew that mm -hmm. you'd get. So I'm sitting next to Peter Cullen, who was wonderful and I did Rainbow Between, uh, on Bobby's World, between. My mall guard. And that character was the same, but he was higher. They mm -hmm. got Rob Paulson to do it. They get him confused uh, because of various reasons. So the director, Jenny McSwain, says, okay, you guys, switch roles because they messed it up. Well, we used to write each other's ad libs. This was after Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And we got yeah. bored, so we'd write, here, try this line. We yeah. did that. So I ripped off one of my ad libs and I and I we were all in the line about 12 people I said pass this down to Rob it's his ad libs it got next to Frank Welker and Frank Welker laughed till he cried can you imagine get a note here here's your ad libs no other business ever no. theater games anything would ever allow you to do that you talk about freedom. Plus, I spent nine years seated next to Rob Paulson. Now, it never happens, not even in Bonanza or a soap opera, but I saw yeah. him every single week. And my job was to make him laugh. Well, I figured if I made him laugh, then I was doing okay. 
Yeah, right. That that's always that's always the test, right? It, the comedians will always say that too. And what's interesting is I I didn't know that you worked with some pretty famous comedians that I was aware of. And uh, and those guys, yeah. By the way, Gilbert Gottfried, nothing like the character he did. Quiet, short, yeah. oh, talk like this. <laughs> that is what you not think he do. But he did that. He's a yeah. total different character than the way he really was. I, I worked on camera with him. Yeah, I'd heard a couple of people mention that and I thought, I can't imagine any other voice coming really? out of that face. Yeah. And so that's it, it it's another interesting thing though to know, thinking seeing him in movies and stuff, uh in the late eighties, thinking that that's just how he spoke. Now it makes a little bit more sense. All the voice acting, Aflac and and uh Aladdin, all that he did, oh, it's because he had a lot of talent. He, he was he was talented in both arenas. And uh well, he could do that character so well. And he stuck to it. He uh, he got fired from Disney because he wouldn't get on a uh, elephant. He goes, Jews don't get on elephants. <laughs> <laughs> Is so that a thing? I don't know. Some safe go or Affleck or something. I don't oh, know. Okay. But he said, Jews don't go get on elephants. <laughs> Hilarious. That's, that's, and my best friend is Brad Garrett, who is a wonderful that, comedian. He did uh, great comedian. Raymond. He played Robbie, the brother, the tall brother. He's six and four. Yeah, but got a great here, voice. Yeah, big character voice. Big, huge voice, yeah. Yeah, he's got a low voice. Yeah, and uh, well, is that I, how he actually speaks? Yeah. Oh, okay. And once okay. I went to Muzo and Frank's, and we had the same manager, Ron Feinberg, because he was 6'4". And so he took a liking to Fred. Mm -hmm. And I had Miami Vance big pants on. You know, they're mm -hmm. loose and suspenders. And I, I went in and sat down, and he went, tell me, Pat, when the joke's over, do you get to take your pants off? <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you find that the majority of voice actors you've worked with just because of the ability to uh, to be spontane uh, sp uh, spontaneous, spontaneous, there we go, <laughs> and uh, that they're just typically really funny. No, not really. No? But no? but there is a a freedom to that choice where you. I mean, if you heard the outtakes from any show, you die. Danny yeah. Clark, this guy, and this guy, they would say. They they'd cut a, they cut away. There's never any uh, but saved uh, cut cutaways except for what Shatner and Orson Welles. No, they did, but mm -hmm. they were hilarious. Uh, yeah. No, they're not generally funny. They're looser. They're a little looser than on camera. I mean, yeah. Mark, Mark Hamill and I work with uh, other stars. You know, Carol Channing and Rip Taylor and all these people. They're a little looser. What? And they're a little more apt to admit Keanu Reeves. I once went into a session with Keanu Reeves. He was doing Ted and Bill's Excellent Adventure. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, the, the cartoon, me, right? put me with Keanu. I don't know why. So I walked <laughs> over to him and he goes, don't turn around. It's Little Richard and he's purple. <laughs> so I did the whole thing like, uh, and he... This guy had a head, huge, and in those days, African Americans had to wear purple if they were dark, and he was purple. Huh? It was like, huh. what a great line! It's Lord yeah, yeah, and he's purple, and he's and he's purple. <laughs> so, so when was that we were, show? We were loser. In fact, Carol Channing once was uh -huh. doing a role in Adam's Family. I was cousin Ed, and John Aston was Gomez. Hey, it was a great cast. Yeah. And Jackson, the engineer, went, Ms. Channing, you're making noise with your blouse again. And she <laughs> said it a third time. She went, oh, that's not a problem. She took off her blouse and did oh, the geez. rest of her part in a good, thank goodness, for a cotton bra. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. yeah, that's that looseness you're talking about right there. <laughs> totally. Yeah. So when you, when you look back at, this huge long career that's included uh teaching since you were four being having this great experience on just 
all the cool things, the anecdotes and stories of your experience in Australia, then coming back, being with these legends, and then you, in your own right, becoming a legend for those in the 80s, 90s. Yeah, I'm old now, so now I'm a legend. You're now a legend. Yeah, hopefully it's not offensive. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, uh, okay. There we I'm go. still around. Keep, it, keep the pacemaker on. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. But do you do you look back at it and and view their peaks and valleys? Do you view certain shows as being that was the pinnacle, or is it really just great to be able to to explore your talent no matter what it is? Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, there's peaks and valleys in every business, but. Uh, of course, you, you reach a valley and you go, I'll never work again. And then you mm -hmm. get a nine series, like Neil Ross had nine shows at the same time. I said, well, you got to keep a cassette so you do, you do the right voice, right? But yeah. uh, there's valleys and peaks. But it's, you know, I've only seen six Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles out of 200 shows. Why? Oh, really? I'm, busy. I'm sort of like the, the car mechanic in a town who drives the worst yeah. car ever because you don't have time yeah. uh, to fix everybody time. else's car. Yeah, totally. And so you're just working later before I die. Hopefully at one point I was literally on television eight hours a day in different shows. Yeah. Someday when I'm really old, I can watch shows 24 hours a day. I've, I've done um, hundreds, if not over a thousand. Well, you're oh, 5,000 characters. Yeah, your IMDb has you above. Uh, it said 10,000 plus characters. So I don't know how they count that, but whatever. Regardless, a ridiculous amount of characters. So in it, what's interesting, again, to jump back a little bit to, to Brave Star, that show was the last show that Filmation did. Filmation is this uh, company that did shows starting in about 80 and they they lasted for about eight years and and but in the 80s from my research they were viewed as this cool new innovative company in the space of uh cartoons and and for voice actors and uh they came out with he-man and i i loved he-man well, and, uh, I've gotten in on Ghostbusters, and then they did oh. He-Man. Then they did another show that was a, uh, I don't know what it was, but it never hit sales. Mm -hmm. And we did uh, Sherlock Holmes of the 21st Century, a pilot. So we kept yeah. on going. But, you know, Filmation was never that clever. It yeah. really wasn't that clever. I think uh, a futuristic Western is clever. That's mm -hmm. interesting. And Brave Star was arguably their best show but they did lone ranger they did uh heckle yeah. and jackal early on and they did ghostbusters because they had the rights and i got uh i couldn't audition for the real ghostbusters because i was doing the original ghostbusters with mm -hmm. filmation but filmation we did two shows a day that's 2400 bucks and we was yeah. in the bank we did that two times a week Oh what? Well, yeah, that that's phenomenal. That's Those... day. So I don't know, four thousand, five, six. It was for like ten grand a week. Yeah, great money, and still time to do other things. And what's yes. uh, what's interesting is the filmation rollout of Brave Star of this show. The people who know it will 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 know it, and I'll put in again some B roll. But they rolled it out kind of in a weird order. I would imagine, and correct me if I'm wrong. You would roll out the show, then maybe do a, a TV made for TV movie. Yeah, and, you think, and then put out the figurine. Well, uh, you know what, Lou Scheimer ran it, and he would have us come into his office, and he have a big design sheet laid out, and he, and he a cup of coffee. Go, oh Pat, now what what characters do you want to do? Dude, are you kidding me? Well, I'll do yeah. that one, and I can separate it from that one. And this, we picked what we wanted to do. I think That's it crazy. was the power that was right there. Lou would yeah. say, well, let's, let's do a, a film first. And that's why they rolled out a film before hmm. the series, which was a uh, economic mistake. Yeah, it 
you watch the film and it's very evident that this is before the show because they're still figuring out they're introducing uh brave star and 3030 and it's it's interesting um that that's just kind of how it ran back in the day before well, you know, uh, these days they display that info out in a pilot and you wouldn't really be that aware of it yeah of yeah. test audience film you have a lot of you you have to do a lot of exposition for a film you want them to get into the action and what characters did you do i'm blanking off the top of my head but other than the main character on that show marshall bravestar what other characters oh, do they have under stick and so he's talked like this and so he was kind of you know what's funny we used to make fun of the ai artificial intelligence hello right. by name is yeah. Bob, right and yeah. so i did thunder stick because he was you know it seemed to fit the character and yeah he was kind of the third fourth main bad guy uh oh, yeah, that... we did, you know what we did like we'd do four or five and then lou would come in with erica his daughter and do some well only a couple actors took umbrage of doing more than three yeah. See, three, and then it was a new contract. Not for us. We did four or five, you know. Just Who's going to do five? Okay, you do them. It didn't matter. Well, we that's, that's what was probably a pro and a con, a, a good and bad of that yes. show. It was, was very cool, fly by night, but a lot of talent just, just, and you said they literally would, <laughs> everybody would be there. That's not the case. When you're doing Buzz Lightyear, you're never going to meet uh, Tom Hanks, right? No, no, oh, no. You're, you're alone. I yeah. went in and did some. Uh, Tim Allen couldn't do exertion sounds. So I went in and uh, John Lasseter was there and he goes, Look, I'm going to call you Bud Light. Because you're going <laughs> to, because he goes, Sir, you bastard. I'm sorry. I don't like him. And uh, they take that out and have to redo a couple of his. Uh, rude lines and also mm. make this sounds oh ah, ah, that that kind of thing so he called me the boss light but i was always alone i go to disney character voice and do a, and then when i finished doing lines you know like four or five or what mm. uh they i take a pause and go okay nieces and nephews let's hear it and they jump in say say hi to bobby is you know and this guy and that guy and it was a, a delight Plus, I'd be on vacation with my wife and kids, and I'd get a call from my agent, and all she would do is hum, the money's for nothing and the check's for free. <sighs> I want my MTV. Yeah. And hang up. I Fire knew I made uh, 2700 bucks because they took to infinity and beyond and put it in a... <laughs> into a little toy. Oh. Anytime you use the line, you had to pay for it. So I go, hey, I just made twenty seven hundred bucks. Give me some of that lotion, will you? Yeah, yeah, that expensive stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're gonna eat tonight in Hawaii. I take well, those. I did. By the way, I did about five crime photos in Kauai. Uh, f- cartoons in Kauai. I in found Kauai. a good studio, and I really? wouldn't come home. Um, Renee would stay a month with the kids on Kauai. Ah, and you just do the work there. Well, some of it, I was some two two weeks, you know, on vacation. <laughs> Highly unusual for an actor. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I was reading a little bit about that show. So it, it kind of, the rollout was, to be kind, we'll say, mis, maybe mismanaged a little bit. And um, it, it ended yeah. up not not being, I think, the success that they thought because they were thinking hey he-man was great the figurine made us even more money and so we'll do it but mismanage a little bit but i was reading yes. that they actually the last show was not brave star it was actually called bravo yeah and i did bravo and you did was, bravo yeah and that was uh 64 episodes and it was like lettuce and vegetables running around mm-hmm. greg hawker was in it and uh, charlie adler and my goodness you know i thought crazy really? yeah they tried to do a spin-off of an unsuccessful show yeah take Great the more successful but they blew it well 
the reason why I wanted to bring this up is to verify one that you did you participated in it, but we've seen this time and time again. Aladdin, arguably the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth most important character, they were the ones that got the spin-off, you know, Iago and the bird or whatever. But they were the funniest. And uh you see it in a bunch of shows. Um Timon and Pumba in Aladdin. Yes. 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 It was funnier when it was a TV show. It was funnier when it was a TV show, and they would take these characters that, if you were to go in order of importance, it, it, it they weren't necessarily in the top five, but they were one of the more funnier for the comic relief side. Yeah. And I thought that that was interesting that, it, again, shows, a, uh, in hindsight, I guess it's always easier, but a little bit of uh, interesting choice, a little bit of mismanagement to pick. They called them prairie people. That's what they called them in the show. But yes. they were... They were sidekicks. They were uh, little helpers that would dig tunnels, and and they well, made a whole show. And I thought, interesting pick. I never saw it, but yeah, well, well it wasn't made into a cartoon. We just got paid, and then L'Oreal bought filmation. But um, look, the thing about it is, it's like the uh, English spin on a series. They'll do three or four, uh, now eight, nine. Mm -hmm. Uh, sequential shows and you get this long movie yeah. if you binge it it's like it's phenomenal long movie and they can leave everything in mm -hmm. well with a cartoon series they, they have more time to talk they don't have to go to another action sequence and and the almighty gag is uh is tantamount in cartoons mm -hmm. you know you gotta tex avery was able to fall a gag in five frames it's always a gag. Yeah, you're you're totally right. I think of a show I liked about a decade ago called Sherlock, and it was yeah. uh, it was like four episodes, but they were all two two and a half hour, whatever it was, two hours long. With and uh, what was that? With Benedict Cumber. Yes, yes, yes. exactly. Love that. Just a great show. In Luther. Oh. Yes, another great one. Yeah. unbelievable but the format is just so different and it's it's interesting to go back again through the years and when i think back to the shows that my grandpa showed me which jetsons flintstones these are kind of the main ones i mean they were prime time shows and i don't think people realize like when you only have two or three channels and a cartoon makes it prime time when everybody when even mom and dad are at home that's that's some unbelievable some serious serious accomplishment we're and talking uh, about business now, Luke. Yeah. Uh, those Saturday morning shows, and then later some other shows, they were, you know, as David Mamet said or wrote, it's not the money, it's the money. And another movie <laughs> said, that's why we named it Money. They were making money. People yeah. were, you know, Sugar Pops, and they were sponsoring wild bill hickok they were sponsoring shows mm -hmm. now when it went to after school after he-man and he-man got a seven point something share i don't know huge right yeah, huge after we went the saturday morning died and it went to the channel 11 and 13s of the world that they're, they're syndicated right yeah they, they spent about a quarter of a million bucks on a cartoon show or more and they go to these channel 11 and say how would you like to have a cartoon series free and they said free are you kidding yeah okay yeah. well I'll, we'll trade you time so they got time and then they went to somebody else and peddled the time oh that's how they made money on those shows so they were the subcontracting out the, the yeah. commercial wow yeah. that's brilliant <laughs> that they, well it's brilliant to you they were taking time allocation and, uh -huh. yeah. and making money yeah and really it's like um gosh I, uh, it, it really is great i forgot what i was gonna say but uh nevertheless it was a smart way of going about it because they made a, a lot of, oh by the way oh teenage mutant ninja turtles do you know who produces it and always has uh no i don't recall a toy company Mattel? We thought we had this great, oh, success and cultural this and that. No, no, we were selling toys. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, they made the money. 
So I, I did watch this documentary recently, and what blew my mind was um, the there was a guy who worked for Mattel, and he was involved in the early 80s uh, in this revolution with uh, G.I. Joe, which you were a part of. <laughs> which was uh, test selling toys. Yeah. I was uh, Ace in the Sky Stalker. They had yes. to buy the plane to get Ace. Oh, really? Interesting. Yeah, so they go from that, this guy, very influential, and I'm for, I forget, I, I, I apologize for forgetting his name, but then he gets hired by a medicine company, and he brings the idea to create Flintstone vitamins. Yes. Unbelievable. And he realizes this can be replicated, and then he ends up going and lands at Sega, and he brings brings the idea of a of character development to to games and yeah. uh creates sonic the hedgehog which is a rival to nintendo and it it it, it made me want to ask you you've done you you've done acting you you've done on the stage you've done i believe you did some acting actually it, it was a, a special voice a southerner voice but you did some acting in lincoln is that correct yeah yeah adr which is looping you know, I, I added voices. Uh, Clint Eastwood, when he does a film, he doesn't like someone in the background going, he wants to hear them do a character or cover it. A oh. lip flap. And I did that. Plus, I, I, I've been in some movies where I was just a voiceover. I think I did a, a Will, uh, what's his name? The actor. Will, he slapped Chris Rock. Will. Oh, Smith. Will Smith. Will Smith. He did yeah. a movie. There was a, a female, uh, a kid, and the rest was CGI, a dog. And I did a character, a voice of the president come over the radio. And I went down south after I did that. And they, because they had no one in it, they put me in the credits and stuff. And all my my relatives down there went, where were you, Pat? We bought that movie and you weren't in it. I felt so bad. I was just a voice. Wait, wait, wait. With all the zombies. Will Smith with all the zombies? Yeah. Is that what you're talking about? What was that called? Uh, it's I can't like read the title. A AI. No, what's it called? It's like, uh, it doesn't matter. But that is very, very interesting. Um, and, you know, a callback to an earlier part of the interview is not a lot of people will know. You mentioned the co star of Will Smith's show that made him big, Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Yeah, exactly. uh, it, Yes, it blew my mind. That guy, the dad, or I guess uncle, in Pre yeah. uh, Fresh Prince of Bel Air, is the other bad guy in Teenage well, Mutant Ninja Turtles. Ninja Turtles, and he left the show to do Friends, Fresh Prince of Bel Air because he wanted mm -hmm. to be on camera, and yeah. so he got somebody to replace him, James Avery. Oh, I I thought he did both the whole time, so he was it ended up being replaced. Okay, yeah, it last three years or so. Okay, yeah. Well, so just to kind of wrap up, I, I'm i wondering, so on your website, you have a, like, I don't know, a lot, 50 or something, a lot of free lessons. But when you find um, people that want to learn about voice acting, maybe they, maybe they, <laughs> maybe they're in my world, but they have this, uh, you know, desire to want to learn to be good. What's one of the first things that they should do? Is it as simple as just do it, dive in, start with some lessons? What should they do? Well, they should learn how to tell a joke because it's got everything in it. Uh, and most importantly, it's what I call a log line. And it's a lesson I learned from the old uh, uh, literary agents. They come into a harried movie mogul and the movie, movie, movie mogul would go, okay, what do you got? And they go, well, he's rocky on, heart, uh, on horseback with a heart. <laughs> you know, they yeah. would sell it with one line. But really what happens is you do a log line for everything you do. And you come up with, and you go for the conflict. Because at the center, the nucleus of all story is conflict. Conflict, yeah. If you don't play the conflict, even a commercial an excerpt from a book, then you don't get it. You won't, you don't get, you don't understand. So play the conflict. 
you know, we hear a lot of commercials or, you know, you know, how many times you how many times you have you heard this, you know, this is a great burger. It's a great description, but nobody says how many times you heard this. It's got three strips of bacon, not two. That's why it's so good. I've yes. told you a story and, and I had misread it because I don't know the answer. So what? That's, that's fundamental. Yes. So the fundamental that you just talked about, I heard you describe in a beautiful and succinct way when you were doing an interview talking about audiobook training, actually. Yeah. And you said, listen, and I'm going to I'm going to try to alley oop this to you. But uh, it basically was, listen, you can go and you can you, you can talk and kind of uh, deliver this line. Or maybe there's two people and, and one person is thinking about what the other person is thinking. But yes. that's not it. There needs to be – we don't think linear or in one voicing. There's going to be different uh, inflections. We think just like you stated, but I, I wanted to kind of get you to talk a little bit more about that because it's, it's very exciting. Even to somebody that doesn't have a future in voice acting – it makes me want to do it. It's like watching somebody on TV play basketball. I want to do it when they do it in a beautiful well, way. Well, I'll tell you what. You, you, you don't ever read a book. You perform it. Mm. When I did Huck Finn, I did 91 characters with an assortment of dialogue. Some I had to make up because he's on a raft and he's going on the Mississippi. So he goes to a little, little place. That dialect is between Arkansas and Louisiana. So... And, and what I tell people is, look, don't don't get yourself all fatutzed about a dialect. It's a taste. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, it's a, it's frosting, but nobody wants a bowl of frosting. <laughs> so yeah. if I'm going to do a Russian, I do a little bit. If I'm Irish, I'll, I'll do a little Irish or a country where I'm, I'm English. That's all. That's all I do. And Indian, I'll mm -hmm. do a little bit. So they know, oh, he must be from a different place. That's all. Because yeah. isn't it a joy that one guy, one person read this whole book or performed the whole book? I love yeah. that. It's it, it's a really great point because the times I've read a book, especially fiction, that it is not, uh, th that I've really enjoyed it. It's when I've really been focused and I think it goes to the point that you're saying is you're not like if you just read it, it's going to be like studying for it's a test like that you're not interested in. Well, it's, yeah. like, it's like documentaries. When you hear someone yeah. who has a good voice and candy comes off the line, it's boring. You got to yeah. own it. And, you know, Scott Brick, who does audiobooks, he's done over a thousand, is great at modeling. I want to I want to point this out as I leave. Mm -hmm. Modeling is the narrator taking on some attributes of a character. Now, listen to me model two different characters. She walked down the hall. She had the baseball bat in her left hand. If she could only get to the kitchen, she'd be okay. He was taking an apple out of the fridge. He was to eat it, maybe before or after she died. You see what I'm doing? Yeah. I'm becoming those characters, but not to the point where I lose my narrator status. That's what Scott Brick does. Yeah. It's a, again, that frost and he, he, he delves into the character and then in, you know, where the mind's going, maybe it goes into a humorous or maybe it goes into an evil place, but it doesn't lose the status of narrator. I love it. Yeah. But if I went, she walked down the hallway, she had a baseball bat in her left hand. He was by the fridge. He was having an apple before or after she died. Well, it's boring. Yeah, it's boring. And sometimes, okay, well, you know, boring. No, I want to, I want to, Americans want to know what to think and feel at any given time in a movie, uh, an audio book. What should I be feeling and thinking? That's the way we are. Americans, we're, we're violent and yeah. we are, um, we want to know what do I feel now? That's why we are, you know, yeah, I and, yeah, yeah. And so I learned a, a great deal about Americans while I was away from America. It's good, bad and ugly. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I, and I, again, I heard in, in closing, I heard, I heard you and uh, one of your colleagues say your job 
as a, as an audiobook voice actor is to make sure that they know who's speaking yes you're delivering all the parts and to also make sure that they feel what that character is feeling or betray that or portray that in to the uh to the listener so that's right I, it's more it's called modeling or shape shifting i like oh i like that term shape Me too. yeah I up. that's great yeah coin that we'll call it the fraley shape shift okay good <laughs> Well, hey, I want to thank you, and I want to, again, encourage everybody, go check out. Listen, I think people find hobbies in sports a lot. They'll find hobbies in things that they watch, but there's it, there's other fun hobbies that you can have. It's fun to jump on YouTube at 36 and decide, hey, I want to I want to focus on what I love or what I've made money. I want to try to help people, and I don't make any money from this, but I also want to connect with people that have had impact that maybe yeah, don't you know. Yeah, make money at everything. No, and there's no. 50 free lessons on my website. And if you That's go great. to contacts, you'll get my personal email and my personal phone number. I'm fast on email, but I'm available until I go to heaven. Then I won't be. <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to thank you so very much, Pat. I hope that uh, you have a, a an understanding that I love. I love what you've done. You have uh, taken your talent and put it into something that that had uh, not to be sappy or too sappy but uh you had an a bit of an impact on uh on my childhood in a very that's, fun that's and positive valuable. way that's valuable what? luke yeah well i thank you very much my friend i hope that we get a chance to talk in the future and uh and hey enjoy the rest of your week thank you i will look at this right. weather come on i'm down in palm desert i'm hot you're, yeah well at least you're not down there in, in august so get back yes. get back oh, before it gets too cool. hot <laughs> yeah all okay. right Pat. adios thank you thank you so much